I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello and welcome to the Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian and together we discuss the unusual, strange, interesting, and oftentimes lesser known aspects of our local history. Joining me today is the fabulous John Boyle. How's it going, John? Uh, it's going great, Chris. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, John is an ensemble member at Jet City Improv. He is also the creator and director of the show Worst Trip Ever, which is going to be performing Saturday night. At 10:30 uh, in October and November of 2015, uh, you want to just tell us a little bit about that show? Sure thing. Uh, basically, the show is where we improvise the world's uh, we improvise one star reviews of the world's greatest places, all from TripAdvisor.com. So Excellent. folks come in and give us a city and a category, and we find the best hotel, the best restaurant, or the best local attraction, and we find terrible one star reviews of places like the Colosseum or the pyramids. <laughs> And then we show people what really happened that day. Awesome. Yeah, it's a hoot. This is a, this is a remount. It went up uh, last year? Uh, yes, yes, mm-hmm. it went up last year. So very excited to bring it back on Saturday. Excellent, excellent. So, John, how long have you lived in Seattle? I have lived, <laughs> I've lived in Seattle longer than I'd like to admit. I think I've lived here probably 25 years. 25 years. But I know okay. nothing about it. Okay. I really don't. I don't. I'm really embarrassed. I don't know anything about That's it. That's a common story. Uh, where, are you, where are you from originally? <laughs> I'm from Minnesota originally. I lived out in Pittsburgh for a while when I was a kid, but Mm. most of my life I've lived out here in Seattle. But again, I know nothing of it. I don't know where anything is. I don't know where the neighborhoods are. I really have just, I don't, I don't know anything about Seattle. Okay, cool. What what brought you out here in the first place? uh, My parents moved around. Oh, right. And uh, my dad took a job out here, so I kind of came along. Cool. Excellent. And uh, you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? I don't. I don't. I hope it's the Seahawks Super Bowl victory. That's the only part of Seattle history mm. I know. Okay, awesome. Uh, so yeah. if it's not before like two years ago, <laughs> Yeah, that you or don't. Mount St. Helens. Come on. Okay. Oh. It's neither of those oh, things. Oh, shit. Mm. Okay. All well, right. Anyway, it's been great. Thanks for having me. Great. Yeah. Th- thanks for being here. Get home safe. <laughs> uh, so let's get started. Okay. Uh, John Considine. John Considine was born in Chicago in 1868. <laughs> it's a good year. He was, it was a good year. Yeah, yeah. He was raised in a conservative Roman Catholic household okay. and grew up to be a policeman in the Chicago PD. Okay. Uh, his career in law enforcement was short-lived, and he left the force to become an actor. What, why, why was it short-lived? Well, he left the force to become an actor. Uh, well, that will, well, I guess a career change will do it. I just wasn't sure if he did something... Nefarious. Oh, he, 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 le- he left the force. He left the force life didn't really suit him much. So he traveled around the country for a time with a small company, mm-hmm. performing where he could, and like most actors, making very little money. That sounds very familiar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's a recurring thing that's been going on for quite some time. That yeah. actors don't make money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are you speaking from experience? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Let's okay. Talk. Okay. Well, let's let's move on then. <laughs> uh, he arrived in Seattle in 1889. So he took the long way from Chicago. He went Seattle. all around the country. Okay, yeah. He great. was traveling around with a troop of actors, and okay. he ended up he ended up here in 1889. Man, that's quite a tour T-shirt. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, around that time, in Pioneer Square, south of Yesler Way, there were a number of clubs called box houses. Uh, a box house was essentially a saloon with a theater that also served as a brothel. Okay. Uh, outlying the main room were several small rooms or boxes. Okay, this is already much better than most of the places I have played at. So okay, uh, yeah, let me know if you know the guy who runs it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I love will. To get booked. You'll you'll know him soon. Oh, you'll good. Know him soon. Good. Yeah. yeah, I love it already. Mm-hmm. Uh, the box houses were typically rowdy, lawless environments. Nice. Um, an account uh, from Coast Magazine described a night in one such box ho- box house. So this is from an article in Coast Magazine. And this is Coast Magazine. This is Coast Magazine. The Coast Magazine. The Coast Magazine. Coast Magazine. Yeah. Before yes. there was Rolling Stone, there was Coast, Coast Magazine. Magazine. Magazine, mm-hmm. yeah. A nervous opium eating individual was hammering away at a piano. In the hall like space before the stage were a hundred or more men and boys. Not a woman was to be seen in the row of seats, only men smoking and boys chewing peanuts. Mm. The boxes were unlighted save for uh, save a stray beam that might enter at the window. In these boxes were women, one in some, more in others. Okay. This sounds already like a 
something that will follow Breaking Bad on AMC. So I'm excited. This, okay. Let's yeah. keep going. Yeah, this yeah. Is good. This is great. Women with dresses reaching nearly to the point above their knees. What? Yeah. Are you serious? With stained and sweaty tights. <laughs> <laughs> with bare arms. Yeah. Chris, Chris, slow down. Slow down. Savor it. It's okay to enjoy it. <laughs> just enjoy it. Taste the words. It's okay. Taste the words. Folks, you can't see what I'm saying. Just just, just enjoy with it. With bare arms and necks uncovered over halfway to their waists. Oh, wow. With blonde hair and some with powdered wigs. With faces rouged and powdered. Eyebrows with winkers smutted up and blackened. <laughs> Dear Coast Magazine, <laughs> I never thought this would happen to me. <laughs> There stood the female contingency at the doors and in the boxes. Wow. Yeah. That's really pretty sexy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. That is some 1890s smut right there. That is. There. That mm-hmm. is pretty smutty. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, box houses charged a small admission price, but made most of their money from the sale of liquor and the gambling tables. Okay. There were burlesque, burlesque acts and minstrel shows. The women who performed on stage circulated throughout the crowd and encouraged men to buy drinks. This is a very overstimulated environment. I mean, you'd think, like, as a small business owner, I would want to focus someone on one thing. I want to get them in. I want them to gamble. I want to get them in to have sex with a prostitute. I want them to get in to have drinks. But mm-hmm. here, it's just like everything is just well, there's over... A lot, there's a lot going on. It's there like is. how casinos try to overstimulate you to try to keep you in. So it's yeah, like, but... I'm bored drinking. I'm going to go gamble. I'm bored with gambling. I'm going to go... Hire a prostitute. I'm bored with this prostitute. I'm gonna go drink again, and it's a it's a vicious cycle. Oh, okay. So but it's a in. casino you go to. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I usually when I go to a casino, I do one, but not all of them. That seems to be all of the things. Mm-hmm. Like I don't go play blackjack and then well, there's you a, there's, know, there's, have a, there's sex a lot with a going on, and then say hit me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's usually multiple things at different times. It's a it's a rowdy environment. Okay, it's mm-hmm. a rowdy environment. Yeah, and you know, and I trust Coast Magazine to take <laughs> this picture. You, uh, have, the, you have no other. Source on this type of area? There's lots of sources there on are? this type of area. Well, we're, going ch- we're going with coast. We're going with coast. Okay, I'm just. <laughs> we're going I, with coast. All right, this is this is your show. I don't mm. want to go in here and boss you around about Coast Magazine. <laughs> uh, the women who performed on stage circulated throughout the crowd and encouraged men to buy drinks, and were given a small cut of the profit for every man they were able to coax into buying a round. Okay, well, mm-hmm. that you know. The boxes for which the club were named were small rooms where prostitution took place. The burlesque performers would spend a small amount of time on stage, then work the crowd. Uh, John Considine was a charismatic man, Mm -hmm. a large presence. He never drank and rarely swore due to his pious upbringing. Okay. He became the manager of one such box house, the People's Theater, shortly after moving to Seattle. So... (laughs) Devout, I, I can see where I, you're where you're having a so, problem. So I'm just struggling here that mm-hmm. a devout religious person is now running. He doesn't drink or gamble mm-hmm. or have sex with prostitutes. Uh, so he's okay. Great. Yeah. So he is uh, he's managing a drunken gambling whorehouse. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's interesting. I wonder what that job interview was like. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the product well? No. No. Mm-hmm. He knows show business, though, because well, he's been traveling around acting. Okay, well, mm-hmm. I, I, that, you know, in all the description of this, you never really mentioned the theater very much. There, so uh, yeah. I'm surprised that that's mm-hmm. the thing that got him mm-hmm. the job. Well, as a sober and shrewd businessman, Considine did well. With his theatrical training, he was able to set himself apart from the rest of the impresarios in the neighborhood by bringing in better acts. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. In most box houses, the inter- entertainment was incidental and not that great. Okay. He brought in national acts and professional performers who would dominate the stage and have other employees work the floor. So he wouldn't have his burlesque performers out then trying to get people to drink. He would have people on the floor getting people to drink, and then the burlesque performers just performing. Okay, so he gets better performers. Yeah. Then. So instead mm-hmm. of like a Sinbad, he gets like a Louis C.K. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like the Emerald Queen Casino and the Tuleo. They're just slightly yeah. different. Or Vegas. It's very, very different than mm-hmm. the Emerald Queen. Definitely, definitely. Uh, everything south of Yesler Way was essentially lawless. The box houses were rowdy and anything went. Considine had to intervene in a knife fight between two of his leading actresses. Okay. All right. Does it say why? Does they were one was stealing the spotlight from oh, the other. Essentially, oh. they were after, and one was trying to steal the public of the other. And oh, so they okay. got into a they into a knife fight, huh. like, like you do, nice. like you do. I know. Mm-hmm. I mean, who among us haven't stabbed someone? That's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other whole other <laughs> can of worms. I don't there, know, yeah. Time. We're running out of time. Confessions with yeah. John Boyle. <laughs> Uh, business was good, even weathering the Depression in 1893. 
But in 1894, a reform movement passed through the city. More conservative individuals came into political power, and the sale of liquor was banned in all box houses. Wow, okay. So you can still have gambling, you can still have burlesque, but you can't sell liquor there. Overnight, business ceased. I'm stunned. Un yeah, unsurprisingly. <laughs> Not just in the People's Theater that John Considine managed, but in all box houses down in Skid Row. Okay. Considine <clears throat> packed up and got out of town, mm. heading to the other side of the mountains to operate a saloon and theater in Spokane. Some of his employees... Things are bad in Seattle when you run to Spokane. <laughs> that, that should tell you something about Seattle. Seattle's not a good place when people are like, hey, we need to find opportunity in mm -hmm. Spokane. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. go. Mm-hmm. Uh... So Considine, or, uh, some of his employees went along with him over to Spokane, okay. including another former police officer, a young man named William Meredith. So okay. Remember that name. William, William Meredith. Meredith. William Meredith. Okay. I'm still remembering a lot about the prostitutes that Coast mm -hmm. Magazine described. You, you earlier, can't really push that out of your I, mind I now, can you? If I'm there, why would I leave? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't get liquor anymore. That, but, well, you know, so, okay, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, that is true. Yeah. Okay, so this guy's name is... William what? Meredith. William Meredith. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he's a former cop, and he's going to Spokane. Yeah, he goes to Spokane to, with him. To chase his dreams like yeah, any young of man Of working would. in a box house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Considine spent a few years as proprietor of the People's Theater in Spokane, but became an unwelcome presence. An ordinance was passed forbidding women to be employed in any variety theater, meaning no more burlesque acts and no more boxes. So this guy destroys culture wherever he goes, basically. He goes to Seattle. No one can have fun anymore. Mm -hmm. He goes to Spokane. You can't have fun in Spokane. Yeah. This guy's pretty shitty. He's well, not, he's it, not really very good at what he does. You don't, don't think, think so? No, he destroys culture where he goes. Mm -hmm. he, you might argue that he's a victim of circumstance, that he goes and there. He, he, the, the ordinance was passed banning liquor, and then he goes somewhere else, and then another ordinance passed with banning women from working in these places. Yeah, but you haven't proved that he isn't the root cause That's of it. That's true, I, I haven't. Mean, I and guess. Post Magazine mentions <laughs> nothing. About it. So, I'm sorry. As far as I'm concerned, this guy is terrible. So, correlation equals causation is what Thank you're you saying. Thank you for reading my blog. I did read your blog, yes. <laughs> but by this time, it was 1897. Okay. And a major change was taking place in Seattle. Hmm. The Klondike Gold Rush had started. Okay. And Seattle was having one of the largest influxes of people in its history. Optimistic and often foolish men came to Seattle to try and catch a steamship to the Great White North to seek their fortune. Right. The ban on selling alcohol in theaters was still on the books, but enforcement all but disappeared. Mm. Letting the citizens of Seattle drink themselves into a stupor and gamble away their money was frowned upon. But allowing visitors from out of town to do so <laughs> was much more accepted. <laughs> Well, sure, they're all going to leave anyway. Mm -hmm. What the hell difference? Yeah, they're just make? here for a little yeah, while. Fair enough. Within a short amount of time after the start of the gold rush, it was like the ban on alcohol never even happened. Okay. Considine was able to secure his old lease at the People's Theater in Seattle starting in 1898, and now it was a whole new ball game. Okay, so he comes back. He comes back to Seattle. Reopens the shop, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. The modest citizenry of Seattle in the early 1890s was nothing compared to this massive horde of would-be miners with their insatiable thirst and hunger. <laughs> Over the period of a few short years, around 70,000 miners passed through Seattle on their way north. Wow. Okay. It's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. William Meredith returned with Considine from Spokane to Seattle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So, so William is still there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Considine's first order of business was to bring in top burlesque, uh, the, the top burlesque dancer in the world at the time, Farida Mazar Spyropolis, better known by her stage name, Little Egypt. Little Egypt. The 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 Little Egypt. Damn. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. One of the Little Egypts. So actually, three burlesque performers ended up taking that name over time, but it was this was the good Little Egypt. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. This, this wasn't like, the legit one. This is the legit. The OG. Yeah, this isn't like second Becky on Roseanne, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this isn't like the, 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 the <laughs> lesser Darren. I was about to say the Darren. <laughs> I was, like, I was like, oh, that's not topical enough. I was like, oh, but the Becky one's way better. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Yeah, great. so this so is the this, good little this Egypt. This is the good little Egypt. Mm -hmm. Great. So she comes in. Um, okay, great. Yeah. I'm totally uh, with it. She gained attention for being arrested in New York for dancing naked. Okay. Scandalous. First of all, that is always a way to get attention as a woman. Yeah. Is to dance naked. Uh, she was later acquitted after telling the judge that she merely appeared naked, but was in fact quite clothed. I choose to believe her. You know, I'm sorry. I, you know, 
Uh, her signature dance was known as the Hoochie Coochie. <laughs> And that's where we get the term hoochie coochie from. Really? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. From the Little Egypt? From the Little Egypt. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Wow. When Little Egypt performed, there were lines around the block, and every seat in the house was taken. The liquor flowed, and the money was rolling in. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Seattle was very much in transition during the gold rush period of the late 1890s. Uh, the mayor, W.D. Wood, resigned his office to head north to the Klondike, as did police officers, streetcar street car conductors, and men and women from all walks of life. So everyone in Seattle went to Alaska, too. People, yeah, there's a massive, so there's a massive influx of miners coming into Seattle, yes. and a lot of the people that support Seattle's infrastructure are also leaving. Wow, okay. So it's a crazy time Great, so around it's here. basically a... Okay, great. Seattle's just a giant whorehouse on the way to Alaska. It's basically uh, kind of what it is. Something like that. Oh, yeah, great. you're actually not that far off. Oh, it okay. was it was <laughs> a pretty lawless and wicked city at that time. Oh, wow. Okay. Cuz you have all these unattached men mm -hmm. coming over looking to go north and this is their last stop of civilization. So they're looking for a good time. They're looking to get rowdy and you have not nearly enough police to handle it and a lot of the police that we do have are leaving to go to the Klondike as well. Wow. So it's a crazy time that is in the 1890s. Crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. The sudden upset in the status quo, combined with the stampede of unattached men from faraway lands, created something of a power vacuum. There was a political battle raging in the newspapers between those who wished to look the other way at the gambling, drinking, and prostitution, and those who saw it as their duty to save the soul of the city, known respectively as open city and closed city advocates. Okay. So open city saying, it's fine. And close okay. cities say, the here. it's not fine. Okay, yeah, so mm -hmm. one's a buzzkill and one's ready to go. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Considine had a great deal of money and was developing powerful friends and had political power in the Fourth Ward, which is one of the largest voting districts in the city. Mm -hmm. People started referring to him as simply as the statesman or boss sport. Oh, oh, he's becoming a kingpin of some kind. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. William Meredith at this point, had resigned from his employment from Considine and returned to a job in law enforcement. Yeah. Oh, the die is cast. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, good for him. Well, you got to go with your heart. I guess so. I mean, I guess watching the Little Egypt dance naked would get old at some point, mm -hmm. I guess. I, I, I don't think it would. But maybe he did. Maybe he did. Maybe that was what put him over the edge. He's like, that is an unclothed woman. That's and unclothed I will woman. have I will have no part of it, sir. Sure, from certain angles, she appears clothed. However, <laughs> I know she is not, and I, good sir, cannot handle it anymore. I said good day. Don't throw your legal technicalities at me. <laughs> I say she was disrobed. <laughs> William Meredith uh, resigned. He returned to law enforcement, and not long later, he arrested an associate of Considine for being a pickpocket. Okay. Mm -hmm. Considine was not happy about that, and publicly claimed Meredith was on the take and had double-crossed him. Hmm. It was a All bit right. of a battle raging. The game is afoot. It is. All right. So, but this is like gangs of Seattle, but no one's interesting yet. <laughs> Right? Is that right? Uh, nobody's playing, or uh, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis isn't in it. Yeah. Or Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, right. So, yes, nobody's interesting in it. Okay, yet. yeah, mm -hmm. right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the two were now enemies, and things only got worse between them when Meredith, in November of 1900, was named Chief of Police. So he got promoted pretty quickly. He got promoted very quickly. Now, is that a testament to how good of a police officer he is, or the fact that there are no police officers left and someone has Probably to Probably more the latter. Okay. Probably more the latter. There's this, all this, influ this, this flux in power going yeah. on, and he just kind of squeezed his way to the top very okay. quickly. Mm -hmm. right. The laws against selling liquor in box houses was still on the books, so Meredith took upon himself to enforce it, but only in Considine's establishment. <laughs> What a dick move. I know. It's such a fuck you. <laughs> oh, man, that's really weak. That, <laughs> it's like uh, food inspectors only enforcing it at Burger King. Yeah. You know. It's a, it's petty. Yeah. It's pretty petty, definitely. The reformers, uh, the closed city advocates, were not satisfied by this attempt at cleaning up Skid Row. The city council was pressured into holding hearings behind closed doors to determine if the mayor and police chief Meredith were in fact complicit with the illegal vice happening in the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. The hearings were supposed to be held in secret, but testimony still made it to the papers. The Seattle Post Intelligencer ran headlines which deteriorated into a battle between Meredith and Considine. 
Okay, so now they're fighting through the newspapers? Essentially, yes. Well, they're fighting in the hearings, but the hearings, all the statements from the hearings are being leaked to the newspapers. Okay. So there's headlines every day, Considine saying Meredith did this, Meredith saying Considine did that. Okay, so mm-hmm. probably a lot of op-eds, scandalous political cartoons. Oh, yeah. Yellow journalism uh, at its finest, okay, definitely. That's... Definitely. A lot of muckraking. Mm-hmm. Considine testified that Meredith was on the take that he was corrupt and extorted money from the owners of box houses in exchange for protection against arrest. Meredith testified that he had knowledge Considine had impregnated a 17-year-old performer and that Considine had forced the young woman to get an abortion. Oh, oh. And this is like an 1898 abortion, right? This is... This is a, about 19, 1900, 1900 at this point. Not yeah. 1900 yeah. Oh, great. So those accusations, though, were later deemed untrue. Oh, really? He actually did not... So as far as we know, he written. did not. So Meredith is kind of a scumbag. Okay, so yeah, so he's not Mr. High and Mighty. They're both they're both kind of scumbags. But... Well, who am I rooting for, Chris? Well, let's 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 <laughs> keep let's keep going. And we'll, we'll find out. You can you can root for neither of them. Does Batman you can root show for up? Both. At some point. I don't mm-hmm. know. Okay. Uh, Considine was quoted as saying to one of Meredith's captains. Quote, look, this is a personal matter. You go back and tell that little son of a bitch that I'll run my business. If they want me for anything at the police station, they can send for me. Never mind. It will only be a few days before they get that shrimp anyway. Unquote. Okay, so so things are now happening. I feel like wheels are turning in the background. Wheels are definitely turning in the background. Okay, like yeah. not in the papers, not in Coast Magazine, but in the background... The various things are happening. Yeah, not even Coast Magazine can stop the gears of what's happening no, now. No, you no, you don't. Coast, they, they, they have a powerful influence. They do. They do, yeah. but not here. They mm-hmm. can't stop this. Later that week, the city council issued their report on the findings of their investigation. It read in part, Money has been paid to Meredith and Detective Wappenstein for the privilege of being permitted to conduct Bunko and Sure Things games in the city undisturbed. <gasps> That for a time, the fleecing of victims in an open manner was a matter of daily and nightly occurrence, that when the victims complained to the police, they were usually told by Meredith or by Wappenstein that they had better be satisfied that they were not themselves incarcerated or detained as witnesses. So the cops are totally on the take. That's, oh, yeah. That's the follow-through here the city Big council time. has? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I trust the bureaucrats to get to the bottom <laughs> of this. So if the Seattle City Council says these guys are on the take... And the filth kingpin is totally legit. That's good enough for me. Are yeah. we done? Uh, we yes, done? that's, that, that's that, the end of the story. Is that the end of the story? Yeah, that's the I end. Just assumed. And everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> I assumed it ended with a bureaucrat's official report. Yes. Uh, is that not That's right? usually the, the cap on a sequence, <laughs> definitely. So the mayor, having received this report, uh-huh. sent word to Meredith that his resignation was expected. Okay. Mm-hmm. Upon hearing the news, Meredith sent a sergeant to buy him a sawed-off shotgun. He then sat at his desk and wrote his letter of resignation, saying he protested the council's findings, but will resign as requested. When asked what he needed the sawed-off shotgun for, Meredith responded, I'm going to get my man. Oh. Okay, then. (laughs) That's, uh... (laughs) Wow. Okay. That's, uh... Yeah, where's a sawed off shotgun? Absolutely. I mean, where do you go for that? I mean, what I love is that they have a problem with liquor and prostitutes, but apparently I can go across <laughs> the street and get a sawed off shotgun, some nice paper. You know, I get a nice piece of paper to resign on and mm-hmm. a quill and ink. Yeah. And, you know, God damn it, I'm here. I'll take that sawed off shotgun, shotgun behind so, the counter. Some chewing opium. Yeah, some chewing and, opium. Yeah. Yeah, it just put it on my tap. I'll yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The following morning, June 25th, 1901. Considine went to his brother Tom's house. Tom informed him that Meredith was after him. John Considine, a teetotaling Catholic, never carried a gun, but that at the advice of his brother, he armed himself with a thirty-eight revolver. John Considine went to work and left work early that day, and with his brother, washed from Washington Street north along Second Avenue. So his, the People's Theater was on Second and Washington. Okay. And so he starts walking north along Second Avenue. Toward the stadiums? Away from the stadiums. Okay, That's, great. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Washington is a little bit south of Yesler Way. Yeah. Oh, you don't know where anything is. I don't That's know where right. Anything is. Yeah, so this uh, is all down in Pioneer Square. Oh, it's I know where Pioneer, yeah, Square Pioneer Square is. So it's yeah, just south. So it's on 2nd, which is just above Occidental. Yeah, yeah, and okay. Second, starts, well, I kind of know where it is. Yeah, 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 yeah and yeah. so he starts walking north along 2nd Avenue. Okay, great. Um, I, I just really like the idea that in 1901 there are still two big ass stadiums. <laughs> so, anyway. 
At the same time, half a mile away, William Meredith was walking south along 2nd Avenue toward the Considine brothers. He was armed with a sawed-off shotgun, a 32 Colt, a 38 revolver, and a dirk knife. Wow! Great! Yeah, that if you can't get it done with all that, you're just He's a failure. Armed to the teeth. I swear, I just you know. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. All right let's, okay. I will go. I want to see. Like, does does it mention what corner they meet at? I don't know. Like, go ahead, read it. Tom and John Considine went into a drugstore on the corner of Second and Yesler. Second and Yesler. Do you know where the uh, Smith Tower is? Yes. That's where, that's Second and Yesler. Okay. Smith Tower is not there yet. It's not there until 1914. But that's oh, spoiler. That's yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Smith Tower gone. Yeah. I'll, even bigger spoiler. The Smith Tower does not factor into this story at all. It doesn't. Not at all. No. no? Not at all. Sorry. Wow. Okay. So I assume they stopped. What did you say? A Starbucks? Uh, Second Yesler in a drugstore. A drugstore. In a drugstore. Not, drug not the Starbucks okay. there. Okay, yeah. The Starbucks is on First. Oh. And, I feel like I'm yeah, cool. done that way. Mm-hmm. Meredith entered the drugstore behind, or uh, yes, they went to the drugstore. Meredith entered the drugstore behind them and fired the shotgun at John Considine. All right, so they're in like a Rite Aid, and he yes. pulls out his shotgun mm-hmm. and sh- shoots at him. Yes, okay. mm-hmm. there's actually a Bartels just down the street around this time period. Is it really? Because remember, you know, Bartels is trusted around here since 1890. It is. You know, I often find great deals at Bartels, Chris. <laughs> Bartels is a fantastic place. They fill my prescription in under an hour every time. Do they really? They really do. I find shopping local makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Bartels. Anyway, Bartels. Uh, I don't think this was a Bartels, but there there was a Bartels <laughs> around. <laughs> I'm trying to get you a sponsor. <laughs> Help me out here, Chris. Uh, first in Yesler, where there's this big sandstone carved door. It's now the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory. That was a Bartels for a while, around this time period. Uh, completely irrelevant to anything we're talking about no, right I, now. For more information about Bartels, I could go to bartelsdrugs.com. Yeah, okay. Probably the website. I hope so. <laughs> So Meredith entered the drugstore behind them and fired the shotgun at John Considine on the corner of 2nd Yesler, and he missed. He missed with the shotgun. Meredith pulled his revolver, and John Considine lunged at him, wrapped him in a bear hug, and forced him back. Okay. Tom, John's brother, rushed forward and managed to wrestle the gun out of Meredith's hand, then beat him about the head with it, fr- fracturing his skull in two places. <laughs> All the while, someone getting paid minimum wage has no idea what to do right now. Yeah. Because there's some brawling guys in the candy aisle. I'm not sure if there is a minimum wage at this point. I don't know when minimum wage came out, but... Oh, God. It's a Republican utopia! (laughs) Uh, I don't know when minimum wage came about. But yeah, somebody working behind the counter, and there's other people in the drugstore saying, what the fuck is going on And that would be extremely jarring. Like, if I swung in for just some, like, gummy worms and my prescription... And, you know, there's a sawed-off shotgun war yeah. going on. I'm picturing the, the pawn shop scene in Pulp Fiction, where the two of them just bust into the pawn shop yes. ready to kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Tom rushes forward. He grabs the gun out of Meredith's hand, start beating him about the head with the gun. Okay. Two police officers were nearby outside when the shooting had begun and rushed to the scene. One ran up behind Tom and pulled the gun out of his hand. Okay. Another man held John Considine from behind. Okay. And Meredith scrambled away. Meredith with a fracture in his skull. A fracture in his skull. He just missed with a shotgun, and he w- he just had was disarmed of one of his revolvers. All right. Mm-hmm. And he has a fractured skull. And he has a fractured skull. Probably a concussion. Probably a concussion. Does it say anything about a concussion? It doesn't say anything about a concussion, You no. can write it in if you want. I, oh, thank you for You're that. Welcome. Well, he did have a fractured skull. Okay. So John was able to break free from the man holding him, and he moved toward Meredith, who was da- uh, dazed from being beat, uh, beaten about the head, like you are, Probably, yeah. and was fumbling at his side for his other gun. His third gun. His so he third shot the gun. shotgun. That didn't work. He pulled out another gun. It was taken from him. So he pulls. He's reaching for his third gun. His third. Okay. Mm-hmm. John Considine drew his thirty-eight revolver and shot Meredith three times in the in the chest, killing him. When Meredith fell lifeless to the ground, John Considine simply handed his gun to one of the officers, who said, "You're under arrest, John." Considine merely nodded in agreement and went peacefully. Oh wow. All right. Well, first of all, it would suck to die of a gun wound in a drugstore because I am surrounded by bandages. That would be <laughs> really frustrating. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think that would be frustrating as I died. Uh, but that's really interesting. Like, of all the hullabaloo with it, he just shot him and went, all right, let's go. Well, he was he was attacked. He was <laughs> Meredith snuck up behind him and attacked him. Oh, and so he wasn't. Defense. He wasn't, yeah. So he just said, well, I'm not going to try to shoot anybody else. He just said, here's your gun and or here's the gun. That I, that I just used to shoot with him. And, yeah, I understand that I'm under arrest because I just shot this guy. We just went peacefully. Oh, oh okay. All right. mm-hmm. 
Meredith, during his time as police chief, had been an open city advocate. But, in the wake of his death, he became canonized by the reformers as a symbol of honor and justice who was shot down by a lawless proprietor of vice and sin. <laughs> so it was total BS, is what Total BS. Total BS. He was this corrupt cop, yeah. chief of police, on the take, not a good guy, and as soon as he got shot... They make him out to be some hero. To be a hero. Yeah, the chief of police was killed in broad daylight by the king of the box houses who had been slandering him in the newspaper for weeks. Admittedly, if you just read the headlines... Doesn't sound good. Doesn't sound good. Doesn't sound good, good at all. Doesn't sound good at all. Mm -mm. Rumors circulated that Considine had in fact fired the first shot and Meredith died trying to defend himself. The Seattle Daily Times, the Seattle PI, and the Seattle Star all published sensational stories that convicted Considine in the court of public opinion. It's great to know that the press is still as honor and trustworthy <laughs> as they are now back then. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why the P.I. died. Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's, why, only, that's why they came down the wrong, the wrong side of this issue. Only 106 years later, oh, the P.I. is out of business. So uh, let that be a lesson to you, journalists. Yeah. <laughs> Get a story wrong, and 106 years later, you're done. <laughs> The Star published a front-page editorial, reading in part, quote, When Considine poured the contents of his revolver into Meredith's body, Meredith not only had no weapon in his hand, but was even dazed, incapacitated condition, he having been beaten on the head with the gun by Considine's brother Tom, witnesses state, until his skull was fractured in two places. It is within the province of every law-abiding citizen of this community to demand that John Considine and Co Tom Con John Considine and Tom Considine be driven out of Seattle once and for all time. And you can't see this because you're listening to it, yes. but there's a lot of caps, a lot of words in all caps in this editorial. I think the big takeaway for me right now is that caps lock existed in 1901, 1902. I had no idea that caps lock existed in mm -hmm. the turn of the century. Yeah. And it could be used so irresponsible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, people yelling at you on the internet, it's not a new thing. It's, I thought... People were yelling I... at you from newspapers in 1901. Wow. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were so ahead of their time. Yeah. It's amazing the star is no longer around. Forerunners. Forerunners, yeah. I know, I know. Considine was charged with first-degree murder, and the prosecution sought death by hanging. At the trial, the Times used their cartoonist to depict Considine as a shifty, remorseless villain. <laughs> That's great. I, I jokingly said earlier that there were probably a lot of nefarious political cartoons. And you are 100% correct. I'm so sad I was right. <laughs> After a two-week trial, the jury was sent to deliberate. They came back three hours later with a verdict. Three hours? Three That's hours. it? That's For it. For death by hanging. For death by hanging, yeah. Wow. It's good to know they took it really seriously. They did, yeah. <laughs> the verdict? Not guilty. Okay. Well, that... Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. I guess it's good. It's good. Well, he... In self-defense, he, he killed Meredith in self-defense. That's true. Meredith that's true. came after him with a small arsenal of weapons. <laughs> that's true. And he you did. just said if he... You said earlier, if he can't get it done with that, yeah, you then... Just, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think you... Yeah, okay. Okay, good. So he, he got off. He's good. He got off. Okay, great. Yeah, he got off. Uh, in the wake of, uh, after the trial, in the wake of the trial, Considine left the box houses behind. He used his talent as an impresario to establish more legitimate theaters. Here in Seattle? Here, uh, starting here in Seattle. Oh. Uh, then he went on to open a string of 52 theaters and rotate talent through on a circuit, becoming one of America's first vaudeville promoters. Wow, okay, so he, so he almost dives in a drugstore, mm -hmm. uh, kills some guy, gets off, or, or kills the bad guy. Mm -hmm. But he's totally corrupt. I mean, he himself is corrupt and a peddler. And then he, he gets off and then he goes becomes straight. an entrepreneur, goes straight, and opens, opens a, string of theaters. a string of theaters. Yeah, he declared himself proprietor of, quote, the first legitimate popular-priced vaudeville chain in the world, unquote. Oh, so he becomes one of the first vaudeville promoter, uh, promoters. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, he moved to Los Angeles, where his descendants became powerful players in the film industry. Wow. Does it say which ones? Uh, the Considines. Who, who are... They became producers. And oh, they, producers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, big wigs and movers and shakers and things oh, wow. like that. Mm -hmm. that's, wow, that's really impressive that um, all the filth and corruption in L.A., 
really, really <laughs> started here in Seattle oh yeah. so long ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he he went he went from being this kind of scuzzy gambling hall, alcohol pushing, prostitution laden individual to becoming this fine upstanding guy after he killed the chief of police in a drugstore. In broad daylight. Oh, when will you let that go? Come on, let him let him just move on with his life, Chris. You had time to move on. You found, I, you I found moved out on, about this Chris. three and a half I minutes. I moved ago. on, and you just focus on this. This guy's mm. providing jobs. Oh yeah, he's a he's, job creator. He's a job creator. Yeah, that's he's exactly. Promoting artists, and you're like, oh, but he killed a guy. Mm. Yeah, but anyway, good for him. Yeah, good for him. That that that's the most American story there is. It really kind of is. It is. Yeah, yeah. a former police officer. Becomes a, a an entrepreneur of vice and sin. Yeah, kills the chief of police, and then goes straight. Yeah, and yeah. becomes probably very wealthy doing it. Yeah. Oh, very wealthy. Yeah, yeah he was incredibly rich. Oh wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, you just don't hear about those stories in Spain or France. They're more they're more here in the American West. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I don't hear many stories at all about Spain and France. <laughs> And I think that has more to do with the circles we run in yeah, and the, the languages we speak yeah. versus... Uh, more of an indictment of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, it's an American success story. It you is. Know, he went from a poor actor to through, through the gamut and then came out on the other side as a, as a well-to-do businessman. And he never gave industry. up. You know, a lot of people who were, you know, hey, you know what? Maybe I should give up. I was almost murdered at a Bartels. And mm-hmm. he's like, no, I'm not going to give up. And look at him now. Bartelsdrugs.com. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening to The Seattle Files. Uh, every week, uh, I'll be back every Tuesday with a new episode. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe and rate us in iTunes. Uh, if you have a topic suggestion, something you'd like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks for being here, John. Hey, thanks, Chris. 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 Being here, John. Hey,